Welcome to the fifth lesson in this series, Investigating Electromagnetic Radiation. In our previous lessons, we explored the interaction between electromagnetic radiation and matter. The photoelectric effect experiment showed that light with enough energy is able to knock electrons off a metal plate. From this, we concluded that light has a particle nature. Einstein called the particles of light photons. We also showed that a photon with a particular energy can be absorbed by an electron and so cause the electron to become excited and move up into a higher energy state. For this to happen, the energy of the photon must be equal to the difference in energy between the energy levels. The electron in the higher energy level is unstable and spontaneously drops down to the lower energy state and emits a photon. We have seen evidence of this process called spontaneous emission when a line emission spectrum forms. Spontaneous emission also takes place whenever light is released by materials. For example, a light bulb is turned on, the element of a toaster glows red, or when a metal is heated. In spontaneous emissions, the photons of light emitted do not travel in the same direction or have the same frequency. But Einstein suggested that it was possible to produce a beam of photons that have the same frequency and wavelength and that all travel in the same direction. Based on Einstein's work, scientists began exploring how to get materials to release photons in a controlled way. They designed an instrument which does this. It is called a laser and the beam of photons it produces is called a laser beam. In this lesson, we will take a closer look at how a simple laser works and find out how lasers are used in our everyday lives. So, by the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain how lasers work, calculate the energy of a laser beam and list some everyday uses of lasers. Let's start by looking at the parts of a laser. A simple laser consists of a tube that has a mirror at each end. One of these mirrors is partially silvered and allows 1% of the light that strikes it to pass through it. At the same end of the tube is a small aperture through which the laser beam can pass. Between the mirrors we find the material that will be used to produce the beams of photons. This is called the lasing material. The final part of the laser is an energy source, such as a flash tube. The word laser is an acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Although that sounds quite complicated, we can break down this acronym to help us understand how a laser works. Let's start by looking at the phrase stimulated emission of radiation. Remember, we have seen that spontaneous emission of light occurs when a photon collides with an atom and its energy is absorbed. This causes an electron to move from the ground state to the excited state. The electron cannot remain at the higher energy level for long and quickly returns to the ground state. When the electron returns to the ground state, it releases a photon. Notice that the number of photons does not increase in this process and that the direction in which the emitted photon moves may not be the same as that of the original photon. Now, stimulated emission of light takes place in a very similar way but has different starting conditions and produces a different result. In stimulated emission, a photon collides with an atom which has an electron that is already in the excited state. Watch what happens next. When a photon hits an atom which already has an electron in the excited state, it is not absorbed but causes or stimulates the electron to drop down to a lower energy level. When the electron drops, it emits a photon of the same energy as the photon which hit the atom. Now there are two photons, the original photon and the emitted one. They both move in the same direction and are in the same phase. So for stimulated emission of radiation to take place, 
we need to get electrons of the lasing material into an excited state and ensure that they are still in this state when they are hit by photons. In other words, they must not drop down immediately, but must be in a metastable state. A metastable state is simply a state in which the electrons remain excited for longer than usual, so that stimulated rather than spontaneous emission can take place. A metastable state can be achieved by transferring energy to the lasing material. We can use different energy sources for this purpose. We can use light from a flash bulb or another laser, an electric current to create a discharge or to increase the temperature of the lasing material and even certain chemicals. When the energy source is turned on, energy is transferred from the energy source to the lasing material. This excites the electrons in the lasing material. We say the material is being pumped. At this point, there are more electrons in higher energy levels than in the ground state. We call this population inversion. Many of the electrons are in a metastable state. Now, if one of the atoms of the lasing material emits a photon due to spontaneous emission, this photon may collide with another atom that has an electron in a metastable state. This electron drops down from the higher energy level to the ground state and emits a photon of the same energy as the photon which hit the atom. If these two photons now collide with two other atoms whose electrons are in a metastable state, each of these atoms will emit another photon. As this process is repeated, so the number of photons increases too. I hope you can see that stimulated emission of radiation produces a large number of photons that are in phase with each other, have the same wavelength and are all moving in the same direction. Now, let's consider the other phrase in our acronym for laser, light amplification. In order to get a laser beam, the number of photons in the beam needs to be very high. Although a large number of photons is emitted by stimulation emission, we need to find a way to increase this number. When the number of photons is increased, we say the light has been amplified. Let's look at the structure of the laser again to see how the laser increases the number of photons. When the lasing material releases photons, some of these photons strike the end mirrors and are reflected back into the material. The reflected photons now stimulate more of the atoms to emit photons. The photons move back and forth between the mirrors, increasing in number. A very small number of photons pass through the partially silvered mirror at one end of the tube. They then pass through the aperture as a narrow beam of photons that are all in phase and have the same wavelength, frequency and energy. So laser light will always be of one color. We say that it is monochromatic light. Monochromatic light is a light of a single frequency or color. Now that we have looked at how lasers work, we can consider the different types of lasers. Lasers are classified according to the material used as the lasing medium. There are three main types of lasers, solid state lasers, gas lasers and semiconductor lasers. An example of a solid state laser is a synthetic ruby laser. The first ruby laser was made by Theodore H. Maiman. The lasing medium is a synthetic ruby rod consisting of aluminium oxide with some aluminium atoms replaced with chromium atoms. The atoms are excited by using light from a flash tube. An example of a gas laser is the helium neon laser. The lasing material is a mixture of 15% helium and 85% neon gas. An electrical discharge is used to excite electrons of the helium atoms. As a result, these electrons move to a metastable state. When they collide with neon atoms, energy is transferred to the electrons of the neon atoms, exciting them. These excited neon electrons 
drop down to a lower energy level and emit photons which form a beam of red light. Lastly, there are semiconductor lasers. An electric current is used to excite the valence electrons in the lasing material. The wavelength and color of the laser beam depends on the semiconductor used. Semiconductor lasers are cheaper, more reliable and more energy efficient than other lasers, so they have many more applications. They are the lasers found in CD players and laser pointers. Clearly, lasers have become very much a part of our lives. So let's look at some places where we use lasers every day. Most supermarkets use a product's barcode when the customer wishes to pay for an item. The scanners used are usually helium neon lasers, but semiconductor lasers can also be used. The laser beam bounces off a rotating mirror and scans the code, sending a beam to a light detector and then to a computer where the product information is stored. Fiber optic cables are a major mode of communication. Multiple signals can be sent with high quality and low loss by light moving along the fibers. The light signals can be sent by either light emitting diodes or lasers. Lasers have the advantage of being monochromatic, which allows the pulse shape to be maintained better over long distances and so lasers allow data to be transferred faster without losing quality. Laser printers use a semiconductor laser together with some of the principles that are used for a photocopier. The laser is focused and scanned across a photoactive selenium coated drum where it produces a charged pattern that mirrors the material to be printed. The drum holds the particles of the toner for transfer and in the presence of heat transfers it to paper that is rolled over the drum. The typical laser used in laser printers is the aluminium gallium arsenide laser with a wavelength of 760 nanometers just outside the infrared range. A very narrow laser beam can be focused to a microscopic dot of extremely high energy. This makes it a useful cutting and cauterizing instrument in medical procedures. A focused laser can be used as an extremely sharp scalpel for delicate surgery, cauterizing as it cuts. Cauterizing means to seal a wound with a heated instrument. The cauterizing action is particularly useful for surgical procedures in blood-rich tissue, such as the liver and the eye. Lasers have been used to make cuts 0.5 micrometers wide. By comparison, a human hair is about 8 micrometers wide. In other words, 160 times wider than a laser cut. And lastly, CDs can store large amounts of data that can be accessed easily and read by lasers. A pattern of holes is etched onto a disk and is interpreted as digital information when a laser contained in a disk reader scans it. As the disk spins, light from the laser is either reflected or not. This provides a stream of zeros and ones that can be turned into music, text, photos, or whatever else can be digitally encoded. For your task today, I want you to complete a simple calculation. A ruby laser produces red light with a wavelength of 694,3 nanometers. Calculate the energy of this light. Well, that's all for this lesson. Until next time, goodbye.